I feel like maybe when it was put back in place, it was drag or something. But I don't know. It's, just, it's got that feeling of like it wants to tip forward a little too much. But it does have, you know, see the center column, I think it would support it.
Good morning and welcome to worship with the people of First Presbyterian Church Edwardsville. You'll notice, if you look around, you'll notice a new uh, area for young children that's in uh, the back southwest portion of our worship space. This was approved by the session at a recent meeting. It is called a pray ground. Now, thanks to everyone who's co-leading this morning, including technology team members Mary Lou Sullivan and Scott Hagen. Our usher is Barb Dooley, organist Robert Raymond, and associate pastor for faith formation Kaylin Stevwing, who is co-leading speaking portions of the liturgy. Thanks to everyone who participated in Trunk or Treat this past Sunday. This year, approximately 100 children were here, and a fun time was had by all. Looking through the weekly calendar of activities, Wednesday is the monthly PW Potluck, Wednesday and Thursday, normal rehearsals, Saturday, a day-long meeting of the Presbytery of Giddings Lovejoy, virtually or in person in Belleville, the business portion begins during the noon hour. Your ministers are scheduled to participate as our elders Scott Hagen and Kurt Linton. Today we launched the 2024 pledge campaign with the theme Grace in Action. And here to deliver a related moment for mission is Elder Kurt Linton. Kurt, I invite you to the microphone. Good morning. Jerry Barber asked if I would speak and give my support for the annual pledge drive. I said yes. Then I thought I would get up and say, I support our annual pledge drive. <laughs> and I hope you will also. Then I'd say thank you and go sit down. But after some thought and prayer, I did not think Jerry nor Pastor John would be very happy. <laughs> I don't think John would say much, but Jerry scares the heck out of me. <laughs> so I prayed asking, what have I done? What should I say? I was hoping that I would wake up in the morning and a written speech would be on the kitchen table. Instead, my mind wandered and had different thoughts that kept me awake at night. The theme for this year's pledge drive is grace and action. Our pledges go towards building maintenance, local missions, church worship, youth activities, and everyday expenses and staff. While on vacation in Florida, my thoughts turned to all-inclusive vacation packages. That's where you pay one price that covered your transportation, <coughs> room, meals, entertainment, and refreshments. I then thought our church is like an all-inclusive package. We receive God's grace, Christian nourishment, uh, God's word and forgiveness. And we have an extended family that prays for us. All-Star Game. I was thinking of the 1963 Major League Baseball All-Star Game. As you can see, my mind really wandered. In 63, the whole National League infield was covered with St. Louis Cardinals. And when I think of First Presbyterian Church of Edwardsville, I think of our All-Star staff. John, Kaylin, Annis, Robert, Beth, and Jim. This is truly a staff of all-stars. We are blessed. Our pledges allow us to have a great staff. Opportunities. Now where's my mind going? As you are aware, expenses increase each year, and so should our pledges. But we don't always have the means. I increase my pledge every year, but I know it's not enough and I need to figure out where to find the funds to increase my pledge. I decided to give up smoking cigars. Well, that is not truthful. Many doctors suggested that I stop. So then I decided. However, that became an opportunity, an opportunity to save a little money and put towards my pledge. Please give some thought and prayer to your pledge. Maybe you can find some opportunities also. Thank you.
Thank you, Kurt. And now the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us share this peace with one another. Please stand if you are able for the responsive call to worship. For we are not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let us worship God.
Trusting in God's grace and mercy, let us join in our prayer of confession. Wake in our hearts, O Lord our God. Make them ever watchful to serve you and your purposes. Trouble us with the smallness of our vision and work. Trouble us with the greatness of your command to make disciples of all nations. Trouble us with your great love for sinners and our own slowness to make you our greatest love. Trouble us with the brevity of our lives and time, talent, and treasure not invested in eternity. Comfort us by drawing us to yourself with your unfailing mercy. Comfort us, O Lord, with the assurance of our salvation and unending glory with you when we suffer and are afflicted. Rekindle in us a renewed desire for the coming of your glorious kingdom, when all wrongs will be made right, when everything that is broken will be made whole, and when we will trade a cross for a crown. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Hear the good news. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. In him our sins are forgiven. May the Lord give strength to all God's people. May the Lord bless us with the grace and peace. Please be seated and join me in our prayer for illumination. Guide us, O God, by your word and Holy Spirit. In your light may we see light. In your truth may we find freedom. In your will may we discover your peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 37. Listen for the word of God. The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Jonathan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. 
The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's second reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8. For we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? The word of the Lord. Last year, 60 Minutes televised a story about how the war in Ukraine has impacted the world of dance. John Wertheim interviewed Olga Smirnova, former principal dancer for the Bolshoi Ballet in Moscow, and five young Ukrainian ballet dancers. Smirnova denounced Putin's war. The Ukrainians were in places subject to airstrikes. All have been relocated to Amsterdam. They are there partially for reasons of safety, but primarily to follow what they all feel is their life's true calling in the world of dance. Their daily stress includes worry about the safety of family members and friends and the places they've left behind. They wonder whether they ever will be able to go home again. For now, they're dependent upon the grace and generosity of the country and people who have welcomed them. Ted Branson is the artistic director of the Dutch National Ballet. He knows all of these people and he offers a hopeful interpretation of his nation's show of solidarity. Dancers will go on. Choreographers will go on. The work will continue. Theaters, ballet companies, they have survived worse. They have survived famines, revolutions, two world wars. I think they will survive this. The ballerinas in Amsterdam and their hosts highlight something that is summed up by the Apostle Paul in today's key verse. Not everything that happens in our world or life experience is good. But for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose, things still can work together for good. Sometimes we are the ones who need to be reminded of this. Unanticipated challenges emerge that threaten to keep us from our goals. Unforeseen circumstances conspire to place us on a path that we did not choose to travel. And then one day it's as if light breaks through the darkness and we see that we have arrived at our true destination. Providence is a word that theologians use to describe this sort of experience. We've talked about it before. We see providence at work in the stories of many of the Bible's greatest characters. For example, there's the story of Joseph, a portion of which Kalin read for us and you will recall his roundabout journey to his life's true destination. Paul, on his journey, also took detours he never imagined at the beginning. Christ led him on missionary journeys to many places, during which time Paul reminds us he suffered whipping, beating, stoning, 
prison, shipwreck, exposure, hunger, and thirst. Now in his letter to the Romans, Paul reflects upon the meaning of all that suffering. And here he pens one of the most quoted sentences in the Bible. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. We may find it difficult to believe Paul's words, especially when we contemplate senseless death or needless suffering. Just two weeks ago in Northern Illinois, a six-year-old boy was stabbed to death. The man who did it was motivated by hatred of Muslims. This week, there was a mass shooting in Lewiston, Maine. It's difficult to believe that these deaths somehow work for good. I argue with Paul when people I care about are seriously injured or terminally ill, or when innocent lives are taken by flying bullets or falling bombs. I feel like Paul would have been a bit closer to the truth if he had said, even when some people misuse freedom and hurt others, still God is with us and God cares for us. Or in life's dark times and at the moment of death, God holds our hand and guides us to his eternal home. But all things work together for good? I find that very hard to believe. Looking closely, Paul doesn't exactly say that all things are good. Paul doesn't claim that evil, tragedy, and suffering are trivial or imaginary. And if we tried to put it into our own words, maybe we'd say, in every place in which we are lost, God is there working to redirect us. No matter how dark the path, Jesus stands in solidarity with us, shining the light toward our true destination. I wonder if maybe it's like the story surrounding Dresden, Germany, that emerges out of the much larger story of World War II. During its final months, a decision was made for a joint U.S.-British air mission. In retrospect, some say that the mission was justified by the fact that Dresden still was an important rail center for the German military. and arms still were produced there. Others say that the war was at a relatively late stage. The city had become a refuge for civilians fleeing the Red Army, and that residential and culturally significant areas were unfairly targeted. For a long time after the war, most Americans didn't know the full story about the air raids the resulting firestorm, and the way tens of thousands of civilians were suffocated and burnt to ash. The website of the National World War II Museum offers a fine summary for those who would like to learn a little bit more, and there will be a link from my blog post. A few months ago, when Therese and I visited Dresden, we spent some time at the Evangelical Lutheran Cathedral, the Frauenkirche. It lay in ruins until the 1990s. Can you imagine that, your destroyed church lying in ruins for 50 years before it was slowly rebuilt, in part using hundreds of stones from the original building still lying around its base? It was rededicated for worship on this Reformation weekend 
18 years ago. In the worship space, we found on display, sort of like our tower bell, they have their old tower cross. It's disfigured by the heat it endured, but it is still recognizable. And the old cross has become a kind of holy relic around which people light candles and pray for peace. The new tower cross on top of the building has a very different story. It was constructed by Alan Smith, a British goldsmith from London whose father, Frank, was a member of one of the air crews who took part in the bombing of Dresden. He made it as an act of contrition, reconciliation, and reparation. When it was installed in June 2004, the external structure of the Frauenkirche was completed and for the first time since the last war, the completed dome and its gilded cross grace the skyline. While inside, I listened to a member guide of the church commenting on the tragedy of war, the power of reconciliation, and the hope that the story of their church holds for us when we feel despair about the state of our world today. As impossible as it sounds, by God's grace and in time, enemies can become friends. The state of the world can feel disastrous to a degree that makes any preacher's words of consolation feel very empty. Like the dancers in Amsterdam, like the members of the Frauenkirche in Dresden, you may have life experiences that make you feel the forces of evil are too strong for faith, hope, and love to make a difference in the welfare of this world. The Bible is bold to say that even in the worst of circumstances, we have reason to hope. All things are not good. Still, all things may work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purposes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's hymn of affirmation is number 817. You may remain seated while we sing.
As we prepare for prayer, we want to remember to lift up all those facing or recovering from medical procedures or making difficult decisions, including Liana and Jay Rizzoli. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, during the change of seasons, we thank you for the simple but vital gifts of shelter, power, heat, water, and food. All our hearts join in gratitude for the blessings we enjoy in worship, music, education, fellowship, and opportunities to pursue service and mission. We acknowledge before you the deep needs of our world. O oh, merciful God, hear and act upon the prayers of your people as we intercede on behalf of those who suffer due to violence in one of its many forms. From wars at a distance, to crimes in our communities, to violence in homes and public spaces that should be places of safety. In each circumstance and need that we speak and think in your presence today, bring the healing of Jesus Christ and the active ministry of his church. Sometimes we see chaos and we feel confused, full of despair. In those times, come, O Christ, to bring clarity, to form order, to help us believe the message that while all is not good, still you work all things together for the good of those who love you, who are called according to your purpose, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Join me in our call to offering. God filled the world with grace and said, now you do this too. God emptied God's self in love and said, now you do this too. So we form our as much love as we give for our Sometimes when we are weak and weary, we need to receive gifts of grace, like the lost son received from his loving father. Grace received is a joyous and wonderful thing. Those of us who have received grace are called, insofar as we are able to share that grace with others. As an expression of grace and action, we really have
join me. Gracious God, you hovered over the waters at the beginning, poised to make something new. Do the same now. Hover over still forming intentions for pledges and give them form. Hover over our gifts and make them into a home fit for everyone who needs it, with safety and healing and food and warmth and mercy and life and grace upon grace for all. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught his disciples when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God is at work in the process, from chaos to creation, from struggle to joy, from death to life, from strangers to friends. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest upon us and go with us 
as we put grace into action. Amen.